Thank you very much, Jason, for accepting to, to reply to our um, few questions. And I would like to start uh, with your own research, where you try to, to construct step by step a, um, a so-called orthogonal translation system uh, that is able to, to read reprogrammed, uh, reprogrammed uh, genetic code and, and insert uh, artificial amino acids into proteins. Can you explain us in a few words, what are the, the fundamental insights you gain from this research? And maybe also what are the applied uh, aspects of, of it? Well, what are the practical applications? Yeah, so, so the basic idea is to be able to uh, build within the cell a version of the translational machinery that operates in parallel with the natural translational machinery. And uh, in order to do that, we've worked on sort of reprogramming the key parts of the translational machinery, including the amino acid alt-RNA synthetase, uh, enzymes, uh, and the ribosome itself, and built essentially a, a parallel pathway that allows us to incorporate a range of uh, uh, different unnatural amino acids into a, a single polypeptide chain in, in, this, in the cell. Um, and so one of the um, things that comes out of this is, you know, when you begin to think about how you would engineer sort of fundamental uh, parts of the cell that you might not uh, that you might think about as being fixed and, and immutable, um, uh, such as the, the ribosome itself, one of the challenges is in fact how, how you do that and one of the solutions that we've uh, come up with that may be applicable to other uh, machineries within the cell is really to, um, uh, to build a second copy, mm -hmm. so to uncouple, uh, to, to build a second copy of the ribosome that's directed to a new message and in this way uncouple the synthesis of uh, uh, proteins on that message from the synthesis of all the other proteins on the cell. And so that has sort of two um, uh, sort of fundamental implications. One of the implications is then that um, that version of the ribosome is then uh, sort of evolvable in the laboratory, if you like, in a way that the natural ribosome is not, because this ribosome is now only making proteins from this one message. Uh, whereas if you try to make mutations in the natural ribosome, which is making all the uh, proteins in the cell, that actually you know, is likely to have a dominant negative effect or mm -hmm. be problematic for protein synthesis in the cell and therefore have an effect on the, on the, ultimately on the biology and the health of the cell. Um, and so I think one sort of insight uh, uh, is, is, is really how you think about actually um, the, the, the types of things in biology that might actually be amenable to engineering if you can build these sorts of orthogonal versions of them uh, that allow you to then, to then engineer them. Now, if you have this, this parallel system that lives sort of side by side with the endogenous one, is there a, a possibility that it may start to compete with the endogenous one, evolve and maybe take over? Uh, are there new forms of life that eventually could, could emer emerge? So, so one of the things we're certainly interested in is whether um, if you can build an entirely parallel system where you're making uh, you know, not just proteins containing a few unnatural amino acids, but maybe um, you're able to reprogram uh, protein translation and reprogram mm -hmm. the ribosome to make entirely new uh, types of polymers, you know, maybe then you can uh, ask you know, whether actually uh, uh, maybe not a competition between the two systems, but whether actually uh, when now you've got this ability to, uh, to have an organism that has an additional class of biopolymers, whether actually you can evolve those biopolymers to take on functions in addition to the functions that are carried out mm -hmm. by, by natural uh, biology that's arisen by natural evolution. And then the question is, you know, can you then do um, things with a new class of polymer that you couldn't do with an old class of polymer? And I think those are open and interesting questions. And the ability to do this in cells and to actually couple, not just the ability to, to encode uh, new amino acids or new monomers into new types of polymers, but the ability to then um, use the processes of evolution uh, naturally or synthetically in the laboratory to actually ask directed questions about what you can then do with that, um, uh, not just with those polymers, but with the organism that's endowed with them. Now, you have started by recording the, the, the genetic code and, and starting with the translation, which is really the core of the, of the central dogma. But could you um, imagine to extend now the approach to ev evolve um, orthogonal systems for DNA replication for membrane biogenesis or mm -hmm. to other pathways? You know, we've certainly been interested in, for example, um, uh, 
coupling or making uh, genes that are not just regulated by orthogonal translation, but also um, taking a, a gene which is recognized uh, by essentially an orthogonal polymerase in the cell to make the mRNA, and then that gene be translated by an, uh, by an orthogonal ribosome. So you basically then end up with a genetic element in the cell which is unreadable by the host, both at the transcriptional or the translational level. And that has some interesting consequences because then both the host, then both the polymerase, the RNA polymerase, and the ribosome are non-essential to the host. And so you can start to actually build uh, different types of regulatory circuits, in fact, that you can't build um, uh, using the endogenous polymerase or the endogenous ribosome because they're both essential. And now your, your background uh, by training, I think, is uh, chemistry. Mm -hmm. And of course your work is re-engineering uh, essential parts of, of, of a cell. So what sort of synergies or interactions do you see between the two young fields of chemical biology and synthetic biology? Yeah, so I mean, so one thing we've started recently at the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology is the Center for Chemical and Synthetic Biology. And really the idea is to, um, ex uh, is to sort of make the connection between, you know, the idea that, that um, really both these fields are involved with synthesis. They're just involved with synthesis using different types of techniques. And in one case, you're using the techniques of genetic engineering to ask questions about how you can synthesize biological molecules to build pathways and control phenomena at the level of molecules and cells, but then entire pathways. Uh, and, and chemical synthesis is classically dealt with, you know, the ability to construct small molecules atom by atom. And really, you know, what we'd like to be able to do is to construct small molecules atom by atom, add those to cells, and to, ha and to build within the cells biosynthetic pathways that allow the cell to use those molecules to, for example, make proteins containing those, uh, containing those molecules that confer particular properties on the protein. Um, and so we see the power of putting those things together um, to, to really actually um, uh, you know, try and get more than you would get out of doing either one of them indiv individually. Mm -hmm. And with your system, you can engineer now proteins at a very detailed level, almost at the atomic uh, mm -hmm. level. Uh, do you think this will provide tools to do sort of in vivo biochemistry that you can observe in real time, real space, biochemical reactions? So, so one example of that would be um, the work we've recently done with um, uh, being able to cage amino acids uh, and put those caged amino acids into proteins. So. Uh, what this allows you to do is to take, for example, a, a protein kinase, um, to inactivate the protein kinase by replacing a key lysine in the active site with a, a caged version of lysine, photocaged version of lysine. And now what this allows you to do is to shine light on the cell now, can, this is a mammalian cell in this case, uh, containing, this, uh, containing this kinase and to activate the kinase. So now if you think about a, a signaling pathway where you have many kinases and maybe you uh, you activate ex uh, the extracellular uh, surface at the receptor. You know, typically you'd activate at, at the receptor and then you maybe measure some, uh, some phenomena downstream of the receptor. But actually, if you can uh, you know, take an arbitrary kinase in that pathway and turn it on uh, and then just watch the elementary step from that kinase signaling to the next kinase, um, then this actually allows you to make, you know, um, uh, make quantitative measurements of um, uh, you know, what happens when I turn on this one kinase, what happens to the, the, you know, the next point, what happens at the next point in the pathway. Um, and this is important, you know, not just for, for studying uh, the kinetics of elementary steps in, in, in signaling, but also actually because, you know, um, many of the phenomena that are perhaps most interesting are, are actually adaptive. And so what you want to be able to do is to make very precise, rapid perturbations. Um, and then to be able to ask, you know, um, you know, uh, questions about the mechanism of adaptation, and um, and you want to be able to make those perturbations on a time scale faster than the mechanisms of adaptation. And do you think uh, you will be able to apply that also in vivo in the in the mouse, for example, and sort of merge the field with uh, optogenetics? And, and, and I think it'll be possible to. Um, I certainly hope it'll be possible to apply. Um, the types of approaches that we've developed or that we've demonstrated in mammalian cells um, to whole animals. So, um, I mean, recently we've shown that you can incorporate um, these types of amino acids into C. elegans, which is the first multicellular organism that this has been done in. And so one of the questions that we're very interested in 
is then um, if you take the, the idea of optogenetics in which you basically put bacterial channels into, uh, in, into, into cells, for example, in the nervous system of, of an animal, and that gives you information about uh, sort of neural connectivity and networks at the level of cell-cell communication. Um, but it's been much harder to get information at the level of endogenous pathways um, in terms of the molecular pathways right in the, in, in the brain. And so one of the sort of potential promises of these types of approaches is because you can put these amino acids into any protein that you like at any position that you like um, in proteins now in an animal, You've got, and you can control the properties of those proteins by shining light on, on and, and decaging those amino acids, you've got the possibility, potentially, of being able to basically do a version of optogenetics that deals not just with cell-cell interactions, but deals actually with controlling the endogenous signaling pathways that operate in and between cells. And so we think, actually, in terms of unpicking um, uh, signaling in the nervous system, that this is potentially a very powerful approach. What sort of advice do you give to your young people joining the lab, or what would be a general recommendation you would give to the next generation of, of scientists? You know, one of the challenges is, which I think has always been a challenge in biology, is to train people in basically doing rigorous quantitative mm -hmm. uh, analysis, right? So, um, and, and to balance this out by actually, you know, stimulating an, an interest in just, you know, asking interesting and creative questions. Um, because I think both of these are, are, are really important. I mean, obviously, you don't want to be doing very detailed analysis on something that ultimately is just not important. On the one hand, um, you need them to be able to, to think beyond actually the data, um, because you need to be able to, at some point, you know, come up with models that you can test, mm -hmm. and this is ultimately is a creative process. Um, uh, but then you can't be, you know, you then have to be able to analyze the data rigorously and not be attached to the details of any particular model. Um, and so you need to basically be almost schizophrenic in your ability to, um, uh, you know, think broadly, uh, but then not get too attached to any mm -hmm. particular hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were a young uh, investigator in the EMBO program, and last year you received the EMBO gold medal and then became a, a member. So from your perspective, uh, what would be your wish list of what EMBO should offer to, to young researchers? Well, I think actually, you know, one of the great things about EMBO is actually the number of um, programs that they have for people at an early stage in their career, not just the postdoctoral fellowships, but the young investigator program. And I think, um, I think that's really important because actually I think, um, you know, especially the, I'll talk about the Young Investigator Program because that's the, the one that I've been part of. I think that's a really um, fantastic and important program in European science because it not only um, brings a cohort of investigators together at an early stage in their career to allow them to, to, to share sort of the challenges they face at that point in their career, but it also gives them um, uh, visibility and, and recognition um, uh, sort of Europe-wide. That's a um, fantastically exciting time, but it's also possibly the most challenging time because the things that you um, then decide to work on, um, you know, you're probably going to be working on for quite a while and may actually define what you do in your independent career. And so having, you know, the support and recognition of um, an organization like EMBO at that point is, I think, um, particularly important.